Good morning, everyone. Thank, uh, welcome to this session of, um, of, of Easy Care and Workshops. And my name is Gonzalo Silva. I'm a recent graduate in metabolomics from Queen's University Belfast. I have a PhD there. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today um, uh, for our workshop of Primer on Resources and Best Practice for Metabolomics Workflows. It's been a bit of a passion project of myself and a couple of friends for a while. And uh, it's actually nice to see that we're doing numbers. Um, I'm just going to go over the uh, schedule really quickly. Just hopefully I can get this to work. Just a very quick introduction. So I'm after a, a very quick opening and introduction right now. Uh, I'm just going to go over a very, very surface level introduction of what metabolomics is and what you can use metabolomics for and a couple of very, very superficial ideas on the workflows. Uh, I'm by far the least qualified person you will be hearing today, so I'm going to leave the really meaty stuff to the experts. Immediately after that, uh, we're going to have uh, Jesten van der Hoof from Wageningen University and Research, uh, who's an expert in computational metabolomics, just to give you a primer on the tools for metabolome mining and how best, you know, data interrogation and how best to use these tools because as somebody who's a bit on the outside of the field, it seems like there's exciting new developments in it every day. So he's probably the best person to give you a, pro a proper rundown of it. And after that, uh, we're going to go into the instrumental route. So my colleague and friend Nicholas Burse, also from Queens, is going to give you an, a primer on, the, if, depending on the study you have and the questions you have for your metabolomic study, uh, what's the right approach and uh, the right instrument and um, all, all, the, all the important aspects of it. And both of these sessions will, will of course have a period of Q&A. So any questions you have, uh, feel free to, uh, throughout the entire session, if any questions you have, just feel free to type them down or at the end of each of these two talks, uh, please do just either raise your hand or so you can, uh, you can unmute yourself and you can basically have a, a, a short uh, chat with our speakers. Um, so, starting at the beginning, uh, what is metabolomics? So, metabolomics is the quantification and study of metabolites, um, small molecules in biological samples. Generally, everything around or lower than one kilodalton is considered a metabolite. And this is basically every single biochemical process which goes on in your body. So, you know, substrates, products, byproducts, intermediates, signaling molecules of metabolism. Um, generally, when people refer to metabolomics, uh, you have a, lo a lot of separate categories. So sugars, amino acids, and nucleotides. When people talk about the study of apolar molecules or lipids in particular, people usually talk about them as, as lipidomics because there's a certain there are significant differences in the way that the studies are conducted and the, even in the instrumentation in a lot of the times. So usually people, when they say metabolomics as a whole, it, they just mean small molecules. Some people refer to lipidomics, particular uh, as the study of lipids in particular, to just lipidomics as well. And you have an entire bur um, burgeoning subfield developing in, in that area as well. Um, if you can if you can look at that little diagram on the right, basically it's the functional aspect of your of of your organism. So you have your DNA or genomics, you have epigenetics as well, then transcriptomics, proteomics, which is also analyzed via mass spectrometry, and then you have the biochemical processes of metabolomics. Metabolomics is the closest to the phenotype of any of these technologies. So it's, it's what makes it both a great technology with a lot of uses and also very challenging because your genome varies little to nothing throughout your entire life. Uh, but every, every single thing you do, like every single meal you have, every time you do exercise and a lot of other processes, it all impacts your metabolism, which makes it exciting, but also quite challenging. And it gives it a lot of really interesting uses. So my background, my background for myself is uh, I did nutritional biomarkers. So you have these large epidemiological studies where people had self-reported dietary intake. And my task was to use metabolomics to find nutritional biomarkers to basically double check in biological samples, such as serum, urine, and saliva, that they were really eating what they were saying. 
but you can use it for a lot of things, not just as biomarkers. You can use it for agriculture and agronomy, basically to see how these species you're cultivating are, are evolving and dealing with their environment. Food authenticity, so if you have a piece of meat, you can basically use metabolomics to check that's actually beef or even in some cases what kind of beef it is, down to the cut. Ecology, um, and it's really having a, a really big impact in drug safety and personalized medicine. So when you're actually uh, testing out a new drug and you're testing some uh, laboratory samples, you can look for all these biochemical parameters, which say, you know, this drug is not triggering these particularly infl inflammatory responses. Um, uh, uh, was one of its possible uses. The really interesting use that it's having recently, at least for me, is as, as disease, bio, disease biomarkers and since they're also signaling molecules as a mechanism in health and disease, because it feels like with um, more, since as the technology evolves and you're having more data and better quality data, as example, you're, I think it's this year, we're having roughly 500,000 people profiled by metabolomics in the UK Biobank. It's really giving us the tools and the power to start having these um, really large, interesting studies. And the really cool thing about metabolomics as well is that it actually plays well with others. So you can already get a lot of inference from, from these uh, studies, uh, from these uh, from this technologies as a base. But uh, when you integrate it with the other technologies mentioned previously, your genome, your transcriptome, and your proteome, you can basically have a much more complete picture of, um, of what, how the organism is behaving. It's a field called systems biology, and it really enables a deeper understanding of living systems and the closer analysis of disease and how the system um, reacts to the condition around it. Uh, there's a couple, these couple, this couple of studies in, on the right here. Um, one of the top one was actually something which I found particularly interesting. It was actually done in, in my university here at Queens, partially, is they basically use systems biology to infer the mitochondria as this very important hub of uh, biological impact during space flight by analyzing both uh, cells, tissues, and the twins of astronauts who went to the International Space Station. So it's a really interesting uh, field. It seems there's new stuff happening in it every day. And it, in a way, feels like it's cashing in. It's helping to start cashing in on that promise of the um, health revolution brought on by the Human Genome Project uh, all those two decades ago. Um, but of course, like like everything, like ev like everything in science, uh, it's an interesting technology. But um, it all starts with good study design. Um, and the first thing you need to ask yourself is: Do you need to use metabolomics for your study? Um, it's something which I'm starting to see in the in the field a bit. Like sometimes people just have some samples lying around; they run metabolomics on them and they're expecting to have answers and that's the wrong way to go about it. So I think before you run your first sample, before you book your first instrument or before any of that, uh, it's very important to know what kind of study you're going for, whether it's exploratory or hypothesis driven, uh, which kind of metabolites you want to look at uh, and um, essentially what you want to do throughout the entire study. Um, it's very important to know that different metabolites benefit from different approaches to um, throughout the entire process. And uh, one of the talks you're going to hear later, Nick, uh, Nick versus, is going to focus solely on that, like just how to tailor your your study to um, um, uh, how to tailor the, the the instrument to the study you actually want to um, go through. It's also very important not to overcomplicate things at any, at any uh, point in your study. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. Uh, so uh, just it's best always to keep it simple, especially when it comes to, to statistics, but obviously not too simple. So when you actually have your, have your samples ready, it's, there's two separate ways. No, there's more than two. But there's two main ways in which people tend to do metabolomics, either quantifying them by NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, or mass spec. Um, most of our talk today is going to be focusing on mass spec, but I'm going to go uh, 
uh, quickly over NMR regardless. It's a spectroscopic technique and essentially places the samples in a very, very strong magnetic field inside a massive magnet, uh, bombards it with an RF pulse. And the point is that certain nuclei in metabolomics, people generally use proton NMR, so 1H, with the spin will resonate as they transition between high and low energy states. And this signal will obviously be impacted by where they are in the molecule, uh, the proximity to other uh, protons and proximity to particularly positive or particularly negative elements. So it gives you a really, really nice, um, out, uh, really nice outlook of the chemical composition of your uh, molecule. Um, it has its advantages and disadvantages. It's not quite as sensitive as, um, as mass spec. And it has tends to quantify less metabolites in general, which can be perfectly fine. Depend if you have a particular set of uh, molecules in mind, and they work well with NMR. There's tends to be less tools to analyze the data with, and uh, it's a bit of an underrated aspect. But an NMR is actually a massive instrument which needs a lot of maintenance. So, so that that's all that also might limit some labs from using it. But it is also non destructive. So you will essentially can run the sample as often as you want until you have like a nice high quality signal to process. And they tend to be higher, have higher producibility. And before you, you, it also be used to be said that they had lower throughput than mass spec, but with platforms like Nightingale, which is the platform which is actually used, uh, being used to profile the metabolome for participants in the UK biobank. Uh, NMR has really done some really interesting strides lately. It's not going to be the focus of the future, the future of this uh, workshop, but I thought it would be interesting to mention it regardless. Um, the, the other main tool used and the one we're going to be focusing the most later on in the, in the talk is mass spec. Uh, so essentially, rather than just analyzing pr protons in the sample, it ionizes the sample. Uh, I said here, samples are chromatographically separated and ionized. They are always ionized, but and Nick will go into more detail on this later. They don't always need to be chromatographically separated. Sometimes you can have like uh, um, a simpler instrument which does, you know, uh, ambient ionization, for example. They're passed through a mass analyzer. So either something called a triple quadrupole, uh, which basically is Two sets of uh, two sets of filters, which use a magnetic field to kind of filter out particular ions before uh, hitting a mass analyzer, being scanned and being separated by their mass to charge ratio. You have a lot of moving parts in these. Uh, oh, pardon me. You have a lot of moving parts in these instruments, so you have several potential instrument confirmations. They have different strengths and weaknesses, and in that area, Nick is definitely the best person to speak with when it comes to, uh, when it comes to uh, what those separate uh, strengths and weaknesses are so we'll give you a good rundown of that later and uh, it's good for uh, quantifying hundreds to thousands of molecules so if you have something that you want to really comprehensively analyze uh, mass spec is usually the way to go it's incredibly sensitive but the um, especially depending on the way you um, obtain and quantify the data, it can be quite challenging to run data analysis. And again, since there are so many moving pieces in one of these instruments, they're generally regarded as being lower reproducibility than uh, something like NMR. In order to, be to better lead in into one of the later talks, I'm also going to go very, very quickly over the, the data acquisition and processing. So. When you have a metabolomic study, you can either have targeted or untargeted metabolomics. Targeted metabolomics being, okay, we have this particular set of uh, compounds we want to look at. We have this, um, pardon me. Oh, wonderful. We have, we have this, um, these instruments which are better at analyzing, for example, lip, uh, lipids, or if you wanted to GC, you can use, you can, if, if you wanted to lipids, you can uh, use a GCMS or, have a particular set of molecules in mind and just tailor your entire workflow towards it. Or you can have untargeted metabolomics essentially seeing, meaning you can, uh, you're going to basically run your samples and have 
try to identify as many compounds as you possibly can, which is increasingly where a lot of the really interesting stuff is coming from. If you're doing targeted, you can use you use something called you can use something called selective reaction monitoring, which is essentially if you're looking at uh, you you use um, part of the instrument the, the initial quadruple essentially is a filter to uh, let only certain um, ions through. You fragment them and you're and you're basically looking out for particular masses on the on the detector and other end of the instrument to basically see okay. This is our parent ion, and it's fragmenting in these into these smaller ions, and you basically piece the whole thing together, and you try to identify our molecule the uh, the best way you can. For untargeted metabolomics, you have three main options: you either have full scan DDA data dependent acquisition or DIA data independent acquisition. Um, full scan is basically what it says on the tin; it just runs a full scan. For, uh, in, in, a, in a very in a very wide uh, mass to charge window, and just quantifies everything with no selection at all. DDA is a bit more complicated in that um, it basically selects a pre a, an amount of uh, precursor ions going in going into the first uh, quadruple to the first part of the mass analyzer, selects the most intensive ones and fragments those. And then it 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 looks at uh, the result, and you basically have to piece them together that way. And DIA is uh, basically where a lot of this uh, a lot of technology is heading, which is you essentially have uh, um, an approach or a, an instrument setting which tries to within a certain time window, within a certain um, space, just uh, collect and fragment every single. Uh, every single precursor ion and just give you a very very thorough look at everything which is in your sample so it's it means it's the most powerful technique but it also means that it's incredibly complicated sometimes to uh look at these uh, to basically get something out of it but again justin will give you a very nice rundown of um of some of the computational uh, pr approaches you have here uh, finally, you have data data analysis and demonstration. So when you have your mass charge ratios, you need to do some quality control and deconvoluted, and identify the compounds. The main one of the big challenges currently in metabolomics, in, of course, in particular in, in, in targeted metabolomics, is spectrum annotation. So when you actually have your spectrum, how it's not exactly one comp uh, one peak. In your spectrum for one compound, you basically have to do a lot of extra work because you have isotopes, you have fragmentation, you have adducts, so your compound might react with something. Um, but there's a there's been a lot of interesting strides in the field, and Justin is going to basically go over that with you in the talk immediately following this one. Um, afterwards, uh, you have your statistical analysis, and of course. Um, in, in the field of metabolomics, it's quite easy to fall on old habits, uh, particularly in the field of biomarkers. Sometimes all you see is people having their molecules and then they run a PCA and then they run a PLSDA and, or a, you know a, a, some machine learning approaches, which are usually sometimes pre-canned. And it basically says, okay, this model, this model has separation or it doesn't. Um, don't do that. It's much better. It's much better to basically just um, before you, you know, before running any samples, just see what kind of questions you're asking. Sometimes all you need is a heat map, or all you need is a t test. Um, sometimes you might, if, especially in large epidemiological studies, you might need some um, something a bit more complicated. But uh, something I, le I learned uh, throughout my PhD is always consult a statistician before <laughs> before you do anything. Uh, with your samples. Um, and of course, um, when you're actually, just because a molecule, especially if you're not using systems biology and you're only using metabolomics, just because a molecule is there, you cannot always be completely sure of why it's there. So with, with biomarkers, this can sometimes be a problem and sometimes, and sometimes not. But if you're using metabolomics data to essentially uh, infer causality for a particular disease, 
or for a particular mechanism in a particular disease. I think it's very important to complement it with something a bit meatier. So as a, just as a quick summary, so um, it's, uh, it's important to know when metabolomics is right for you and before you do anything. And one thing I really hope you get from the following two talks is, if, especially if you're into the field is to know before you do anything, uh, if you have the right study design for a metabolomic study, if it's adequately powered, if you have the proper equipment for the job you want to, for the questions you want to ask, the appropriate quality controls, and you know, es essentially after you run the samples, how confident you are in your analytes, and uh, do you know what to do with your data? Uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions now. It, I, I spoke a bit quicker than I was expecting. I'm just going to stop screen sharing. Uh, yes, so if anybody has any questions, please feel free to. We still have about five minutes before uh, Justin's talk. So if you have any questions or any comments or anything at all, uh, please feel free to just uh, raise your hand. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you fine. I just wanted to um, ask a bit about the, uh, you may come on to this again later, but the data independent acquisition and the analysis mm -hmm. for that. So a lot of the runs we do, so I'm at the University of Sheffield, a lot of the runs we mm -hmm. do on our um, LC, we also acquire DIA data from it. But to mm -hmm. this point, no one's properly analyzed it because we don't have the statistical tools or analytical tools in place for that. So can you speak a little bit about um, the potential tools that you guys use or what is used generally in the field? Because this is something I'm a bit unsure about still. That's actually really, uh, actually the, the, somebody who might know a bit more about, I, I did mostly targeted metabolomics when I was, I'm actually going, only going into the IA now, but uh, Nick, uh, do you have any, do you know any of the tools most used for the IA or? Yeah, in terms of data independent acquisition, it very much depends on your sort of data processing pathways. Um, there are a couple of the vendors uh, have software that uh, supports processing um, data sets where you're um, fragmenting all of the, the sample. Um, and then you can um, start playing about with the fragmentation patterns to understand uh, the the parent molecules that you're you're fragmenting um but quite a lot of the, the workflows that we're seeing and i'm sure justin will um expand on this um it tends to be um custom script custom code people are are um, tailoring what they do obviously there's the 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 sort of uh, the packages out there mz mine um and the like which can be used for um processing and, and onto the sort of annotation uh, pathways. But uh, in terms of, of actual DIA workflows, um, it really depends on, on what you're doing and, and um, where you're going. And there's, there's also, of course, a number of um, artificial intelligence packages that are being uh, developed, which give you some idea now on fragmentation patterns so you can understand a bit more what's happening in your data set at the um, at the analysis stage um, so a bit more of the sort of in silico um, workflows so it's it's uh, yeah but it really depends on what you're doing and what why you're um, doing uh, DIA um, what the the end goal is um, and that will shape your um, data processing I uh, thank you appreciate it do you have any more questions? Okay. It's a little bit earlier, but uh, Justin, if you'd be happy to start like two minutes before. Or... Sure, no problem. Mm -hmm. We may add all, we may also finish a bit earlier then, but let's see how things go. Sorry about that. Just... Uh, Alex, you still have a hand up. Is that an old hand by now or a fresh hand? Yeah, sorry. The sun's on my screen. So I can't see it. Hang on, I'll put it down. No worries. <laughs> so let's see if I can actually 
uh, share my screen that so another question is can you see something yeah we can hear we can see the one one of the big buildings at the Wageningen University I assume yeah okay cool so let, let me start and maybe uh oh you want to say something uh Pozzalo? Oh no no! Um, oh. I gave you like a quick introduction um, in the very in the very beginning. So ah, okay, I, it's... cool. Which I of course missed. So uh, apologies about that. Uh, but um, but here I am. So what you're seeing now is is uh, one of the buildings of the Wageningen University campus. It is not the newest anymore, but uh, it is one of the newer buildings. Uh, it's called Orion, and um, the the most of the bachelor teaching is taking place there. Um, which includes some of the courses that I'm involved in. Um, so my name is Justin van der Hoofd. I am an assistant professor in, in Wageningen. So um, I have my group in uh, computational metabolomics. And um, today I will guide you through some of the recent developments in how we can uh, create yeah, a meaning from metabolomics data. So. Um, Consado and Nick, I, I trust that you will look at the chat to see what is going on there. And um, so I don't mind uh, uh, being stopped and, and, and asked questions because I think this is like uh, meant to be a training rather than me uh, um, showing or telling all sorts of, of, of things. So um, let's make it as interactive as possible despite uh, being uh, online. So, um, okay, now. Let's see if this is gonna be work out. So now you can hopefully see the first slide. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'm glad technology is uh, <laughs> is, is cooperating today. So um, yeah. So you you asked me basically, can you tell us something about uh, annotation? Um, I'm aware that the order of things is is maybe a little bit uh, uh, strange because. After me, you will hear again more about what uh, what type of metabolomics um, uh, platform and technology to choose from Nick. Um, but at the same time, um, if you know what the limits are in terms of, of annotation and what the difficulties are, um, then uh, it is also good. Uh, it's a good information to choose your your platform of, of choice as well. So. In my talk, it will be mainly about mass spectrometry data um, and in particular LCMS. Uh, however, um, many of the algorithms in theory could be applied to GCMS as well, um, but it would need uh, people to do some effort in linking uh, the data formats and making sure that the input to the tools uh, is, is, is such a way organized that, it, that the tools can actually work with the data. So on the screen, and don't worry, I will not mention them all today, you see a number of logos of the tools that I was involved in uh, during my postdoc in Glasgow, like MS2 LDA, Unsupervised Substitute Discovery, and also some of the tools that I uh, that my group more recently uh, published, like MS2 Query and, and Fermo. Um, today, uh, some of them will be mentioned and, and a little bit explained, and others are not. Um, but if you look up my uh, uh, through my Twitter and also through the uh, website, and I hope, no, yeah, there we go. So if you want to know more about uh, my group and uh, uh, and and the research going on and the, the papers we publish in the preprints, then uh, there is a website where you can find more information, um, and of course. If you follow me on on the socials like LinkedIn and Twitter, we uh, uh, and or the group, we will try to keep you informed as well. So this is an overview, basically, of one of the key uh, aspects of workflows that my group wants to uh, materialize. So starting from natural mixtures, going to structure and function. So if we start to look at the figure on the left bottom, that basically the aim is can we um uh, can we make can we somehow uh let the samples speak for themselves right can we find out what are the structures in there and what they are doing right so 
And uh, uh, Gonzalo already kindly introduced you to some generic background yeah, about metabolomics and why it's important. And you can see that yeah, the, the, the sample input, uh, that part is, is also presented on top. That is not what my group uh, is, is mostly involved in, uh, but I do have uh, collaborations and also new PhD students starting this year that will be involved also in sample uh, um, extraction and, 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 and stuff like that. So uh, in other words, it's of course important to know where your samples, oh, what your samples are and where, where the input samples come from. But then the good news about the mass spectrometer, it doesn't really care what you put in, right? It, it, it takes everything you, you put in and it tries to produce you uh, the spectra that you can also see on the screen. Um, and um, basically, uh, what you can see is that my group is trying to, do, or well, is, is developing methods, I have to say, uh, to kind of uh, ease the puzzling we have. And the way to look at it, if, if, you are, uh, uh, if you are a fan of jigsaw puzzling, you know that there are puzzles that, that you get the pieces and an idea of what you have to puzzle, but you don't get to see the real uh, uh, thing you are supposed to be, uh, the real picture you are supposed to be making. It's called uh, uh, Waschai or uh, in, in Dutch, so Wikshu in, in, in English, I guess. So uh, what what's up or what else? Um, basically, uh, that's the metabolomics problem in a nutshell, right? We oftentimes know roughly what we should expect, but we don't really know what uh, what what the end what the overall real structure is. Um, and uh, my group is trying is building the methods, for example, based on machine learning to help the researchers in the process to give some guidance. So, for example, in normal puzzling, we would start with the finding the corners, making the edges, and in a way, uh, my tools will do that for you, hopefully. Uh, in, a, in a way that it will make it easier for you to puzzle the final picture together for each of the molecules in your sample. And then in the end, also be able to add the functions to, to that. But for that, you are relying on additional information coming from bioassay data, bioactivity data, or from other omics like transatomics and, and genomics. Um, and... Um, so this is my group. And of course, I, I have to thank uh, uh, all of them for doing the hard work. And don't worry, uh, the, the the youngest member that is there is not really part of the group yet. Uh, she has to wait a little bit. Um, but um, today, uh, uh, some of the work, I will, some of the, the things I will be telling were done uh, by myself during my postdoc together with a lot of other people back then. And some of the things uh, were actually done uh, in the time that I was a, that I'm a group leader here in Wageningen. No? So um, yeah, so I I decided that I will re uh, repeat a little bit what you have seen, but that that is not because I don't trust Gonzalo for doing a, uh, doing a, a nice explanation, but just to make sure that we are on the same ball when it comes to uh, uh, like what we will be discussing. So you see that. Metabolites are coming off the column. That that the mass spec has an iron source that that ionizes and 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 uh, makes uh, um, uh, puts the metabolites in the gas phase. Then we have a mass spectrometer. In this case, it's an orbit trap, but you know equally well you could envision a, a, a TOF, and then we get some sort of spectrum out of that, right? And then. Um, the nice thing is that we can not only get MS, so-called MS1 or full scan data, but we can also do fragmentation. And the fragmentation is often resulting in kind of a fingerprint or barcode of the metabolite. I'll get back to that as well. So we get the cycles of full scans and MS2 scans for the whole chromatogram. And that is the basis of, of, of the information we have to then puzzle together what was there. So... This is uh, an example of an MS1 full scan with a lot of peaks. Um, and then you hope that the mass spec, based on the settings you do in the acquisition parameters, is selecting a lot of metabolites that you can then uh, extract also in terms of their uh, extracted ion chromatogram. So you can see that they are eluding at various times, and you hope that you also get MSMS spectra for many of them. 
because they help to actually do the structural elucidation. And of course, with programs like XMS, MZM Mine, uh, and others, you can then also uh, try to align the, the, the peaks from the same metabolite across the different samples, which will allow you to, co to compare the metabolomics. So the challenge is really not that, that, we, that you don't know anything, but the diversity of the chemical structures in the complex mixtures is enormous. And that has to do with basic biology, but also with the many, many signals we get from the mass spec. It's not only, it's not one signal per metabolite, right? It, it's like a lot of signals in theory per metabolite for various reasons. And what is also important is that there are a lot of unknown unknowns still. So if you take urine, yeah, uh, we know most of it, right? Because that's water. Uh, if not, then go to the doctor. Um, but the, the remaining few percent, those are where the challenges are, okay? So this is really important to keep in mind that, that we, we, we uh, depending on your diet and, and, uh, and all the other things that, that, that you're exposed to, your urine metabolome profile will change. And many of these things, we don't know exactly what they are yet. So we, we use, as I said, fragmentation experiments. And, and again, I take an example of the orbit trap, in this case, an LTQ orbit trap that I used during my PhD here in uh, Wageningen. Um, and why I do that is just to show you that, that it's not, I mean, it's part of the solution, but it also makes things complicated, yeah? more complicated. Why? Because we can do this fragmentation different, in different ways. And, and this instrument has two fragmentation cells. So one of them, is in the iron, so called iron trap part. So that is uh, doing CID, collision induced dissociation fragmentation. So here you see an example of such a spectrum. And here you see an example of the same molecule fragmented in a different uh, part of the instrument in the HCD, the higher collision dissociation collision cell of the orbit trap. And the difference, as you can see, uh, uh, there are, you know, we see correspondence in terms of the fragments that are that appear, but also differences. And uh, um, that's not only because of the different energy that was applied, because that's another thing that you can vary with, but also because of the different nature of the fragmentation itself. So this is something to keep in mind. It doesn't make our life always easier, but it also opens up possibilities of, of trying to get the optimal fragmentation section for each molecule. So often people mention barcode, fingerprint in their data. And this is one of my uh, favorite victims to show. It's a histidine, it's a amino acid, but it has this nice parts that we can also link back the, the spectrum to the structure, right? We can see fragments here. So we can see a neutral loss here from the parent ion or precursor ion to one of the, the main fragments. And then we can see that uh, the mass fragments, they contain nitrogen and two, and then we can relate that back to the specific uh, uh, ring part of histidine, right? Um, the other way around, we can look at the neutral loss. We see all the oxygens are gone. So the one out of the 10 fragment has three nitrogens. So we can be quite confident that that is the carboxylic acid part that is uh, uh, broken off of the main, of the overall structure. So already now we can start to link the, the fragments and the neutral losses to the structure. Of course, we know the structure, it's easier, but now we need to do it for the unknowns as well, all right? So a couple of words on, on why untalked metabolomics in particular made a big jump over the last five to 10 years. This has, I think, three main reasons, but feel free to add more if you know more. Uh, instrumentation got more sensitive and faster. Uh, the generic extraction protocols are much more feasible these days. And there's a much higher throughput, route, and, and uh, that is partly also because of fractionation robots and auto-samplers that became better and better. Um, and this is just to back up my statement. If you look in PubMed, in this case for Antarctic Metabolomics, then this is kind of the picture you see, right? And I, don't, I, th I think it speaks for itself, right? Uh, no need to add more words to that. However, I also believe there's a hidden uh, reason as well. And that is uh, that, that uh, the analysis that is still complicated, uh, complex and can be complicated and can be time demanding 
is, is, is becoming easier and easier. And why is that? Because, and I'm highly biased, so that's a huge disclaimer, it's because uh, uh, groups, more and more groups, including my own group, are starting to, to kind of develop the tools to make the researcher's life easier, okay? So, um, and you can see that this is only searching for computational metabolomics, not even for computational mass spectrometry and all the other uh, names that people tend to use for this type of uh, uh, tools. And you can see that that uh, uh, we were nearly getting to 1,000 publications about this topic uh, a year, which is, I think, incredible. And you can be lucky if you start your PhD now and you want to do metabolomics, uh, because uh, this is when I uh, this is when I started my PhD, and you can see that that the number of tools that came out and and that were published is is dwarfed now. And and I had to do a lot of manual analysis still. And I think uh, uh, some parts of my PhD would have been much more quicker uh, today. So. Um, yeah. Uh, there we are. Yeah. So how to annotate now? I mean, after all these uh, uh, opportunities and challenges, I will guide you to some of the yeah uh, more recent developments uh, and uh, um, how to annotate structures and substructures based on this MSMS data. Um, again, if you have any questions, uh, don't be shy and ask them in the chat. Um, uh, and if you are a daring person, uh, it's also fine to open up your microphone and, and interrupt me. Yeah. So um, I won't be offended. So there's a picture, and actually, uh, I did I did my internship in Copenhagen uh, during my studies, and uh, I lived uh, in Copenhagen for uh, for nearly seven months. And on the first place I lived, uh, this was this is the opposite building. And and the reason I took this picture is is to uh, to explain you how to how do we this annotation and that is because uh, 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 what we do is is what you already did but you didn't know you looked at the picture and you you tried to to see what it is right and and I hope all of you uh, concluded that it's a building yeah and the, why how how did you come to that conclusion I think because you recognized windows uh, and the typical structures that you expect for a building. And effectively, that's what we're doing in, in a lot of the computation with the volumics tools today. Yeah, uh, there's nothing else than what you just did. Uh, they they look at the spectra, try to recognize common uh, patterns that we can link to what we already know. So, for example, if you can recognize a particular scaffold of a flavonoid based on two or three peaks, then the tool will, will try to do that and give you back, okay, very likely to be cursative because we see this fragments. And actually it also replicates what I did during my PhD manually. Yeah? I went through the LCM SMS data set and then I recognized, ah, when I see these two peaks, it is cursive. So basically uh, we're trying to automate that process at the same time, also trying to keep explain eh, and make sure that the user, you can uh, get insight in, 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 in how the decisions were made. So um, basically, it's all about improved annotation power by pattern mining. And this is another picture that uh, even if you look briefly at it, I think what you will conclude, there are two groups. And again, it's nothing else than, than, than pattern mining, but you just did. And uh, basically, if we translate it to metabolomics data, we want to find molecular families based on the MSMS spectral similarity but we also would like to extract some of the building blocks of metabolomics or the substructures. So, and we can then exploit the grouping we have based on the spectra to propagate structural features and to annotate whole family chemistries. And the first tool I want to kind of put on the table for you uh, is uh, uh, based on machine learning and then in particular topic modeling. It's called ms da unsupervised substructure discovery. Okay, so ms da comes, is the name that I coined and I realized it's not easy to pronounce, um, but at the same time, I liked it because MS2 is MS2 data, right? MSMS, and then LDA is the algorithm, the topic modeling algorithm. So a latent Dirichlet allocation, okay? 
you can forget about it again, but M is 2 LDA. And the other way to say it is MS, mass spectrometry, to the LDA algorithm. So basically, uh, that's why I like the name and, and we stuck to it. So, and actually, I already explained kind of the idea, right? So we have MS data and we want to use this topic modeling algorithm to extract the building blocks. And the way that it works is as follows. So normally, you can do this topic modeling for text. So imagine yourself, you uh, you have to, you get a, you get a sign uh, by a friend here. We have 100 papers. Please read them and, and help me to structure that information. So, and typically, um, uh, if you would be able to use uh, machine learning, you can ask, you, you can start by, by uh, importing all the words, removing all the redundant words, and then let the algorithm find uh, the, the uh, words that are often co-occurring across this document or papers in, in your case now. And, and you can see on the, on the screen, on the slide, example for two documents, short documents. So, uh, and you see that the, the red words have been found by the algorithm to often co-occur across various documents. And the same is true for the blue words and the green words. And now uh, we come to two very nice properties of this topic modeling. So one, it can recognize more than one topic or group of words in one document. And two, it can recognize the same or similar topics across documents. And if you think about molecules, then that's exactly what we need for substructures or building blocks, right? One molecule can consist of two, one, two, three, or more building blocks. And also they can reoccur in, in various metabolites because you know nature is lazy, right? If if something works, let's reuse it, right? So, and that is exactly why this kind of pattern mining algorithms can do their job. So uh th thanks for for the for the laziness in a way, right? Um so. What, but there's one drawback of this unsupervised algorithms, and that is it doesn't do the actual annotation for you, right? So the red words are found by topic modeling, but it, but that's it. So you, as a human, you still have to do the annotation. And the idea is then, of course, in this case, uh, I hope I can convince you that this is a football-related uh, uh, topic, So uh, because the words are united, football, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and the blue words, similarly, uh, we can hopefully agree that it's business related, et cetera, et cetera. So now, so now you know the advantages and the disadvantages. Let's let's move to the metabolomics world. And as you can see, um, um, uh, we have spectra. The spectra become the documents or the papers, and the peaks and the losses become the words. Right. So our they, those are effective words we give into the algorithm. And the idea is then, can the algorithm find co-occurring peaks and losses that are kind of related to a topic or in our case, a substructure? Well, of course, the answer, I mean, the tool is out since 2016. So the answer shouldn't surprise you anymore. And uh, the answer is yes. Uh, it was able to find uh, biochemically relevant uh, substructures in for me, very relevant uh, extracts of uh, Scottish uh, beers. Um, um, it's a bit early maybe to talk about beer, but anyway, I will do it anyway. Uh, it is a fantastic test material because it's the combined metabolomes of three different things like hop, grain, etc., and yeast. So and and that and, and you cook it for one hour. So it becomes a fantastic mixture of all sorts of, of things, including amino acids, sugars, and 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 also aromatic uh, uh, molecules. And you can see that exactly those were also picked up by MS2 LDA. Um, so um, in the middle part, you see uh, a network based on the substructure. So each circle is a motive or mass to motive or a substructure pattern that ms 2 have found. And each orange uh, dot is, oh, sorry, each uh, blue square thing that you can see is a molecule. And there's a connection to a motive if, if uh, the algorithm thought it was present. So uh, for the paper in PNES, we uh, also did some validation with uh, standards back then, 2,000 standards from uh, MassBank, and I think almost 5,000 from, from 
uh, GPS. And that, because that's, that's all there was at that stage that we could use. And I would like to stress that if you look at how the field uh, mature, um, kind of uh, matured, then uh, by now we can use, uh, I think, 300,000 uh, uh, spectra and structure information from GMPS alone. So this also gives you a good idea of how the field is really pushing uh, uh, forward. So, but anyway, oops. Uh, uh, anyway, what we look at here is one of the um, uh, motives, master motives or substitute patterns that MS Tully have found. I chose this one because um, everything starts, right? Every, every project starts. And here uh, we, we started uh, with trying it out on a file, right? And I got back the first results in a CSV file. And, and, and this was actually... Uh, the first motive that I recognized and, and that I thought, okay, this could become something. Yeah. So it was like the aha moment. And um, uh, maybe some of you already saw by eye what these structures have in common. Yeah? That is this adenine substructure. And you can also see on the left in the spectra that, that yes, they share some spectral properties, right? But they're not identical. And that's also something I would like to stress. So even though you have different uh, kind of relative intensities of the of the ions, so different instruments that was measured. That doesn't mean that the algorithm can no longer find the relationships. I mean, sometimes it will be hard because the differences are too large, but you can see it can work. And at the same time, we can also recognize this is green loss. And this green loss was found also in other uh, metabolites with other scaffolds, let's say. And actually, that's related to the sugar. So MSODA was able to build up the, 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 the adenosine uh, structure out of the two building blocks that it has. So actually, I think that's also a very nice example of, of, of how this tool can work. So, but I already told you that there's a huge drawback, right? You need, you need to annotate the spectra. And that is what, uh, uh, so one solution that we uh, offer now is so-called MotiveDB, a database of objects detectable Substructures. So basically, if this is your samples and your spectra, uh, uh, then uh, and actually, I'll give you the example of my own my own adventure, right? So I I analyzed or reanalyzed some public data from bacteria, and uh, this was one of the motives that I got from MSTLDA. So then, uh, using uh, literature and, and and previous annotations, I could actually um, annotate uh, the add a structure to this um, uh, master motive data um, as the um, lactone ring of actinum, actinomycin B. Um, so, and basically now uh, uh, there is an annotated motive in motive DB with this streptomyces salinia spora uh, kind of data set that if you have the uh, bacterial data that you know are related to this species then, or to this bacteria, then uh, you can add these motives to your experiment and they will be fixed. So, so the, 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 the features uh, that are in this motive, they, uh, they, are, uh, to get, they stick together. And then if a metabolite has those features, it's sufficient uh, uh, abundance, then the motive will be automatically connected to your spectrum together with this annotation. So, yeah, basically, it's also a call out to you if you are working with MSMS data already, if you are uh, uh, considering doing um, a sub uh, this unsupervised substitute discovery, then also consider to create a new motive set in MotiveDB once you're finished and you have annotated some data because you yourself and others uh, uh, can really reuse that, that information. So, uh, how can we use this? Well, for example, to, to dig into the to, to plant uh, data, as I will show in a brief example, based on this Ramna CI plant uh, family. So all you need to remember now is that it has two different clades. So the Remnoid clade and the Zizifoid clade, okay? Uh, with two representative uh, pictures of them. And I, I included a short intermezzo about chemical compound class ontology. So um, remember um, the puzzle I showed you at the beginning, right? So where you first 
search for the corners and then for the for the for the edges. And I think that that whole part of the puzzling I relate also to this chemical compound class. So um, because oftentimes you know, based on on the fragments you observe, you can already start to hypothesize what type of molecule it could be. And that is kind of the, the chemical compound class, right? So we have flavonoids, tetrapenoids, uh, terpenes in, in plants, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the nice thing about the recent years is that there's various novel ontologies that describe this chemical compound class is in a systematic way. So that is what, what the ontology brings. It, it brings structure and uh, uh, a systematic way of describing things. And if if you need one thing to compare and, and, and do analysis, it's this organization and the systematics. So that is a really also a big gain that we had over the last years. And you can see how you can divide the different chemical compound classes if you observe in plants and also other organisms in the various uh, uh, chemical kingdom, superclass class and subclasses. So it's also even the art form. And yeah, as we can see, these chemical classes are also related to each other. So we can use that information also in follow-up analysis. Um, and Molden and Hanser was coined uh, in, in, in 2019. Uh, um, spearheaded by Madeleine Ernst, who is now working in Copenhagen, uh, and also together with uh, Kyo Bin Kang, who is now working in uh, Seoul in Korea. He's assistant professor there. Uh, and, and we kind of uh, teamed up uh, when I was doing my postdoc in the, in the Doris team lab. Um, and we created this mole enhancer tool. And basically it takes in data, uh, uh, you, uh, if you're familiar with the GPS uh, platform that was coined in, uh, by the Dorset group in San Diego, spearheaded by uh, Ming Sun Wang, uh, then uh, actually you can already apply it on your existing jobs. Um, um, all you need to do is add uh, structure information, for example, through a network annotation propagation that was uh, spearheaded by Ricardo da Silva, who is now working uh, in Brazil. Uh, and um, basically, you can, uh, the, the modern answer tool will predict or infer chemical compound classes for your spectra. So you can get a high level overview as represented in the bottom right of the slide. But also, uh, you can add MSTLDA results once you run them. And you can also look at the chemical details. So what can it bring you? Well, uh, um, so, uh, and, and by the way, if you're interested in, in to read more about what I'm telling you, uh, then uh, one of the papers I can recommend is by Jean-Luc Wolfender et al. Uh, in analytical chemistry. Uh, uh, disclaimer, I'm also one of the authors. So uh, there's also other work out there that you can read. Um, and uh, if you want to know more about a specific example, there is a publication also associated with it in the Plant Journal back in 2019. So um, eliminating the, the chemistry we can do now, right? We can use this real data and we can now color all the, com all the spectra according to their predicted chemical class. And the good news is we see really a lot of plant-related classifications, right? Flavonoids phenolics to terpenoids. So it makes sense, right? Even the program didn't know that. The program didn't know what kind of samples we used. So uh, it's good to see this kind of uh, 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 validation, right? Um, and then when we zoom in into the details, then we can look at the family of flavonoid glycosides. And just to remind you, uh, uh, each circle is a, is a spectrum, MSMS spectrum. And each connection is there when the similarity between the two spectra, MSMS spectra, is high enough. And, and what that means, I, I will get back to in, in a minute or two. So, and here we, we actually plotted with colors uh, the presence or absence of motives, substructive patterns. And you can see that the top of this family is particularly blue, and the bottom is more uh, purple and, and light blue. And what it actually means in practice is that we can recognize subfamilies, the top based on the scaffold camperol and the bottom based on the scaffold quercetin. If you're doing plant metabolomics, you will recognize these names. If not, then by now, you know the two most common scaffolds, flavonoid scaffolds 
uh, in plants. Um, and they have a lot of analogs because different sugars are attached to them. So uh, we can also zoom in into a different kind of uh, uh, chemistry, in this case, three terpenoids. And there we can also call our motive presence. And now we see certainly that we recognize what type of benzoic acid conjugate was actually merged with the three terpenoids coupled. So is it proto-catechuric proto acid, tongue breaker? Is it phenylic acid or is it chimeric acid? Yeah. And, and you see that predominantly it seems to be a chimeric acid with a few, with a few uh, uh, exceptions. Yeah, so um, basically uh, if you are interested in this particular chemistry and how it differs across the different plants, then this is one way of having a, a quick insight in what are the features that I need to look at, all right? So another intermezzo, maybe a bit longer than the other one, so it's not a short intermezzo, and it's about decoding fragmentation spectra. So just to get you on, on, on board, like, okay, uh, what's going on? So we have structure, right? This is a molecular structure. If we break it up in the mass spec, then let's say that uh, it, it breaks up into four different parts. And then we can run an MSMS fragmentation spectrum from it. So we have uh, various mass fragments and a, a precursor ion in, in the dashed line. So now we can try to relate back the information from the spectrum to the structure, right? We know the structure, so we can work out that, let's say, this loss is related to the brown part of the molecule. So it basically means that the brown part of the molecule is gone and the other three parts are still assembled. And uh, sorry, and then the blue peaks, the blue color peaks now, the two highest ones, they are maybe related to the blue building block. So that means that but by then, only the blue building block is left. Yeah. Um, but if we now compare it to a so-called analog, which is related, only modified slightly on three different positions. Yeah. So the orange, the orange sub substructure uh, grew a little. Uh, the purple triangle substructure got a little extension. Let's say methylation. Uh, and then uh, the brown substructure also got a little bit larger. Then what we typically observe in the spectrum is that a lot of things are moving around. Yeah, So the, the peaks are no longer at the same place. And you may think like, okay, so what? Yeah, uh, but uh, most of the currently used uh, mass, spectrum, mass spectral similarity score, for example, cosine score, modified cosine score, the normalized dot product, which is the same as the cosine score in a way, um, they all rely on this uh, fragment overlap. So what they look for is the, the all the fragments that are in common. And the more they are in common and the more abundant they are, the higher the score becomes. But you can also see already that with two or three or four subtle modifications, this kind of overlap can, can vanish very quickly. So that is why my group is also investigating alternative ways of doing the spectral similarity, okay? And let's have a look at some of the recent uh, developments there. And uh, um, I will speed up a little bit to make sure that we still have questions at the end. So I already discussed this analogy between uh, the text mining also for the ms 2 example. And the idea here is that these two sentences, unless you come from Italy, yeah, it's a joke. You, uh, uh, they, uh, yeah, they mean kind of the same thing, right? So we can correspond like the meaning of the words, like uh, lies and loves and cake and cookie, etc. And in metabolomics, we have the words, we have the fragments, but we would love to do the same thing, right? We would love to be able to find which fragments are structurally related to each other because they only have a small modification, like. In the example of fragment A and fragment A prime. Yeah. Um, so, what we now uh, uh, tried and, and also showed uh, later on is to use an embedding based algorithm. And we, we basically transformed word to fact into spec to fact. And spec to fact, and basically, uh, the way it, it works is that 
uh, out of the vocabulary, which in, in text is, is all the words. You can see here, Lux, K, Cappuccino, etc. So you see all the words. And, and basically we aim to create artificial dimensions that sometimes may mean something, sometimes not, but, but they, they kind of rely on which words are often uh, found together in the data, basically. Yeah, so it's a bit similar to the topic modeling, but now rather than looking at at, at really uh, um, this this groups of words that often co-occur, we look more from the whole data perspective. And um, basically, as you can see here, uh, we have two artificial dimensions that I created, one for positive affection, one for hot drinks, and you can see how I assign values for each uh, word. Uh, but of course, in practice, the computer will learn it from a lot of examples, in this case, text. Um, and then you may get values like this, hopefully. Uh, and of course, we don't actually know the the real, what they really mean, right? So uh, uh, it's just a mention one and two. Um, and in our case, we have many, many more, you know, uh, words or fragments and losses and also many dimensions, right? Uh, up to 200 or 300 that, that we typically use. And then uh, what we can do, what can we do now with this artificial world? Because we have a, a, a three-dimensional artificial world created and, and where all these fragments that we have observed in the data are part of. So now we can find a position in this new world uh, based on each of the spectra, or, uh, based on the fragments and losses they have. And once we found this position in, in, the, in this new world, we can compare it to another position of another spectrum. And that is one of the use cases that, that we used. So uh, uh, um, we use that to do a, a library um, matching, for example, and analog search. And let me show you the results for the analog search. So uh, 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 it really allowed us to do fast and scalable analog search. Uh, so uh, why? Because we trained this new world. Uh, it took a few hours, but after that, to look up where a particular molecule uh, spectrum is in that space is really fast. So we can go in with a new spectrum that 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 was not part of the training or evaluation uh, uh, yet. So not part of the training. So let's say the test set, if you do machine learning, then uh, we went into it and we checked uh, for the, the spectrum that represented this uh, cyclic peptide, what kind of closest uh, spectra in this new world uh, return. And you can see that six other uh, circular uh, cyclic peptides return, right? So, and with different masses and, and uh, uh, pretty pretty good, I would say, right? It, I mean, if you wouldn't know the structure of your query compound, you get a, you get a good idea that it, 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 it very well may be a, a cyclic peptide. And in D, in subclass D, we see the same thing, right? Our query compound, pretend we don't know it, it's like a lipid-like molecule. Then you also will hopefully uh, conclude that that you will have that you have a lipid-like molecule. Mm -hmm. And on the on the top in B, you see that that uh, uh, um, if we do this uh, on a more kind of um, assemble way, in a benchmarking way, that uh, especially if we look at at all the examples from mass 400 and higher, we really get uh, on average very uh, uh, sorry for the best uh, uh, the best hit of the top 10 results return pretty high uh, uh, Tanimoto scores and Tanimoto score I will I will get back to in the in the, uh, in, the in the next after in the second next slide because first I want to switch to say that that we actually continued this this analog search and and uh, together with Nick de Jonge he's uh, my, uh, my PhD student uh, he works with me uh, on uh, developing computational metabolomics tools for uh, to improve annotation. Um, and, and this is like uh, um, MSU query is the uh, build on the IDs we had with SpectroVac and also uh, its supervised cost in ms deep score that I will not go into detail today, in view of time. Uh, but if you want to know more, have a look at, at our previous work. And also have a look at the preprint that is already out on the bio archive. Um, and the idea behind uh, MS2 query is, and the reason why you would like to do analog search in the first place is that uh, um, oftentimes there are no exact matches uh, available in the library to do your annotations, right? 
So one way to circumvent that is to allow to find uh, structures that are related to your query. And that is exactly what MS2 query is, is doing. So uh, uh, we see here three different query structures, and we see also the found analog by MS2 query. And now the standing motor score is nothing else than a, a way to try to give a score to the structural similarity between these two structures based on presence absence of structural features in, in the molecules. Okay, the higher the more similar. Let's let's and let's stop here for the sake of time in terms of explaining that. Um, and let's have a look at the results. And and uh, uh, basically, um, there's some good news and there's some bad news. So let's start with the good news: is that uh, uh, MS2 Query uh, outperformed the the other the other uh, uh, things here that we tested. Uh, the modified cosine score often used by people that that are into into uh, uh, finding analogs using the, for example, the GPS uh, platform. Um, MS2 Deep Score, our own uh, uh, tool that that we also uh, that is also one of the features in the MS2 Query model, by the way. And then MS2 Query itself is the the the, the blue line, and you can see. And the average standing motor score, so the higher the better, actually uh, is, is better across the whole board. And uh, the way to read this is that we start on the left with 100% recall, which means that that basically the threshold we use is very low, so you get everything back. And the, the more to the right we go into the figure, the more stringent we put our threshold, the more uh, so the, the the fewer hits we get back. So uh, that also means that you would expect to get better results back, and that is also true. So, so far the good news. Uh, the bad news is that we have another two lines. So one of them is for the random. So you see random, we see a very low score effort, so slightly more than 0.2. So that's re uh, reassuring that we actually see some real signal in the data, but we also see the optimal curve, and that is still much higher, I would argue, than we are. So it's like around 0.2 nine something eh, for the for the more stringent uh, uh, recalls. So we still have some work to do, but on the way it's also good news for me because it means that I still have some time with my group to further develop uh, this methods. So um, yeah, I will skip this a bit. Uh, if you're interested, it is already available on GitHub basically, uh, and you can already use it. And, and uh, there is also instructions on how to use it. So. Um, and you can also add your own spectra uh, uh, as a library if you are a bit advanced uh, user, I would say. So the final tool I wanted to mention is called Fermo. It's also already available. It is spearheaded by uh, Mitya Saduk, a postdoc in the group of uh, Marnix Medema here in Mahling and also in my group. And uh, uh, you can read all about it at the preprint on BioArchive already. Uh, basically, um, as I can imagine, many of you, if you have, you have normally have questions about, you know, uh, can we find molecules or samples that are of interest related to my question, to my metadata? And Fermo is trying to give, uh, to help you there, right? So it, it's a data integration tool uh, that, uh, which needs the role LCMSMS data kind of, bioactivity and the metadata. It does then the linking and annotation for you. Uh, based on uh, MS2 query, for example, uh, it does some metric calculation and scoring, for example, how novel are the molecules and actually are they correlated to the bioactivity? And then uh, uh, you can do your visualization and interpretation. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, this is like some screenshots of, of the dashboard too. So basically if you, uh, at the moment, it's available on GitHub. If you clone it, you can run it on your own machine. And we are we are thinking about how best to, for example, make it also available in an online form. But for now, if you are if you are familiar with Git a little bit, you can already let it run on your own uh, uh, laptop. And basically, you can start reading data and and kind of explore it. And you see the different uh, uh, views. Um, so, um, but. Why is it so useful? Why can it be so useful? Uh, it's all about prioritization of the signals in your data and the samples uh, by removing actually the non-relevant features. I think that is an important thing to mention. Like 
it's not so much like directly focusing on what what are the the uh, exciting uh, features to go after to validate no you start with in this example with with uh, nearly 150 features um and then you slowly remove kind of everything that is that you can already safely assume that is non relevant because it's uh, uh, related with your controls and the blank uh, it is uh, not not correlated with the bioactivity etc cetera, etc cetera, at all right and then in the end in this case you see that we only are left with three features that particularly could be responsible for the antibiotic activity and in this case this was data reused data that Micha earlier obtained and we we already uh, could validate that yeah, the ciomycins are indeed antibiotics. So, yeah, um, I typically do this as well. Uh, a call to action, sharing is caring. Uh, I already mentioned it a little bit uh, uh, when I talked about MotiveDB, uh, but um, to really, to help my group and other groups to build these tools, uh, uh, share your smiles, and, and that can be in the, in the literary sense, of course, as well. But also, please, uh, in 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 terms of uh, te textual structural information about the structures and your spectra and and all these tools will be uh, really uh, grateful that you see on the screen. And you see also some uh, genomic uh, uh, databases, by the way, if you're into that area. I didn't touch today, and my big, uh, uh, for example, the Paired Omics platform. They also uh, are very grateful for input data. Then um, I also am teaching as part of my job, and and I've also thought about how to make uh, this whole new world that I discussed, this embeddings, latent space, more appealing to the students and to you. So, and this is an example of how we did that together with the Wonder team here, Wageningen. So this is now this uh, uh, many dimensional space reduced to three dimensions rather than the typical two that you see in the paper. And then the students can browse through this through this uh, um, um, embedding. And each, each uh, dot is a molecule here placed into the space based, based on the spectrum. And each color is a compound class that we also discussed at the different types of molecules. And then the students have to answer the question, can the computer learn something about chemistry based on the spectral data? And what I typically hope is that the students conclude that yes, it's possible. Yes, the, the computer can learn something yeah, because we typically see uh, roughly that similar colored dots are grouping together. And that means that the same um, molecular classes came together in this embedding. Which is of course helpful if you talk about annotation, analog finding, and other things. So my outlook, and again, uh, uh, um, you know, if you want to read more about all the things I said, apart from from the newest kits on the block, Abyss to Query and Fermo, you can uh, I I can safely refer to you to this reference uh, disclaimer. I'm I'm part of the author list, so again, uh, um, I can. All, yeah, there's also other work out there that that you could read. But here in this paper, we kind of uh, we, no, we we actually uh, work towards the perspective of large scale uh, uh, omics analysis, also to do the substructure annotation. Uh, uh, when we come in with our mixtures, we want to get out this kind of uh, uh, annotated uh, data sets using the class annotation, using substructure annotation, and also doing the network analysis based on the, the spectral similarity. I did not really spend time on that today, but there's really uh, great reviews out there on, for example, the use of molecular networking in natural products, in clinical metabolomics, and in most of the, the, the typical metabolomics disciplines that you have today. So I can also refer to that um, for, for more information on that. So um, and and to the to the reference paper on the on this slide. Yep. So uh, with that, I want to thank you so much for your attention. I hope you're still awake. That's the, the, the disadvantage of this kind of online setting. I have no idea, but I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, um, uh, there's still um, 
the, my Twitter handles uh, on the slide. Uh, I'm also LinkedIn if you are left uh, the Twitter uh, universe, Twitterverse, so to speak. And um, uh, happy to answer any questions now. Thank you so much, Justin. That is really great. I'm pretty sure everybody is awake and enjoying themselves. Uh, we already have one question actually from Alex Henderson. He's asking how specific are these tools to plants uh, for the human metabolome? Would we have to rebuild the data corpus from scratch? Yeah, so um, uh, that's a good question. Um, and I refer back to what I said uh, when uh, all the way at the start. Um, so uh, the mass spectrometer doesn't really care what you throw at it, right? I mean, it may get blocked or 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 uh, polluted, and and uh, uh, so I shouldn't say that it doesn't really care. Otherwise, Nick may become angry. But um, no, uh, in principle, the 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 mass spec is oblivious to what you throw at it. Yeah, uh, it's you who has to give the context of okay, what type of sample, and uh, but once you start to do the analysis, so. Um, uh, human data, uh, uh, people have been measuring a lot of uh, human based uh, uh, samples, and there's also quite some annotations already available. So uh, um, it's perfectly possible to use uh, this, uh, the tools that I described to, to help you to understand the human metabolome. Wonderful. Are there any more questions? Happy to. We still have about five minutes before uh, next talk. So uh, I actually have one question for you, Justin, and it's a, just a point of personal personal um, curiosity. And I spoke about this with Nick as well, because now you have all these new, you know, natural language uh, software, basically just allowing you to sometimes speak with your data directly. And I was just wondering, where do you see this sort of uh, technology going as far as analyzing metabolomic data goes within a few years? Now you have Microsoft with stuff with OpenAI, you have uh, you know, AlphaFold, and they're tr just trying to make it very, like a one-stop shop for all your data analysis needs. And that was just, but since you know metabolomic is significantly more complicated than, well, not not in, in parallel than protein folding, but uh, where do you see the where do you see this going in the next five or ten years? Yeah, so that that's of course a very uh, open ended question, and um, it's recorded, so probably you will get back to me in five or ten years um, <laughs> saying that I was all wrong. But uh, I think. I mean, the alpha fold comparison for those of you not in, in proteomics uh, uh, or, or protein structure prediction. Uh, so alpha fold managed, is managing to create quite reliable 3D structure predictions based on the sequence of proteins alone uh, using uh, uh, relying on, on the measurement of 200,000 uh, kind of uh, structure uh, sequence pairs that were experimentally validated and, and built and 100,000 uh, augmented uh, versions of that. So in total, 200,000 experimental data points and 100,000 augmented points, uh, they managed to, to come up with a, with, with a model. Um, so I think eh, uh, it's very hard to predict where that alpha fold moment will arise for metabolomics because of two reasons. One, we don't, I mean, the sequence of a protein is very, I mean, hey, you have uh, uh, 26, 30 amino acids, uh, and, and, and then in, in an order, right? And, and uh, that's the input uh, that we want. And then we want to predict the structure. Here, we have a structure, even let's make it 2D, the two-dimensional, not to involve the, the difficulties of stereochemistry, but we don't have that structured input as much, right? We have spectra, but the, as I also showed, they can be different in terms of relative intensities, even fragments we observe for the same molecule at, at, at the same instrument in a different uh, fragmentation cell. So it's this lack of kind of harmonious input data uh, uh, that, that will, we will need much more examples, basically. That is, that is uh, if, if I cut my story shorter, we will need a lot more examples then uh, that probably are needed for alpha fold. And that means that we have to wait a bit longer before a similar setup can, can push that boundary. 
to, to where alpha fold is, is now for the protein structure prediction. However, I'm very, I mean, I want to be optimistic here, right? Uh, so I think the, the, the good news is that the, the more and more tools become available to make your life easier so that you are more quickly arriving at the point where you have an interesting feature of which you know already something. And then it's up to the researcher like you to kind of make the final step and do the, the final push to the complete annotation. However, then I again, uh, sharing is caring. I mean, if you don't share the final structure and the spectrum in an in accessible way in a public library, yeah, then we will get stuck, right? So it's really, uh, uh, um, yeah, that is the kind of the part that I really think is important to stress, right? And then in five years, I think uh, there's these direct models that are already appearing, right? We've seen Mass Novelist, MS Novelist, Mass Genie, and some others. So they, I mean, starts are made, but their performance is now, I would say, it's already promising, but it's not, I mean, you cannot really rely on it yet, but the more input data, training data it will get, the better the performance will become. So five years, maybe a bit early, but in 10 years, I think those kind of, of, of models will, will, will challenge, uh, will actually, you know, challenge the current uh, 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 better performing algorithms uh, on, on the annotation basis. Yeah. Let's talk. Let's talk. let's talk again in ten years. And see, in uh, ten years, I'll, I'll bookmark the video because yeah. I'll probably forget the. But just as an aside, like in terms of sharing, uh, sharing data and sharing protocols and sharing everything like that, you're speaking to the correct audience because that's what the UKRN is generally all about. Uh, so we're half eleven on the dot. Uh, Nick, do you want to basically have give everybody like a five minute break just to maybe use the restroom, have a snack, or yeah? So I think. Um, Rather than starting exactly at 11.30 with next talk, we're going to give it like a short five minutes break and we'll be back here at 11.35. Uh, so welcome back, everybody. Just giving everybody like a minute to get back. Yeah, so <laughs> that was a really good uh, really good talk by Justin. And again, if uh, if anybody had to drop in or drop out at any point, and even after this, this will all be available online in, in the UKRN YouTube channel. Uh, so it's 11.35 now, so, so I will cede the word to my colleague, Nick, who's going to go more into the instrumentation of mass spec. Uh, you can take it away. He's also right next to me, so this is why, that's why I'm looking to the left. Take it away, Nick. So we're doing that uh, mute and unmute thing uh, so that we don't have a dreadful echo uh, ringing around. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the data acquisition side rather than the data processing, um, and it will feed very much into the uh, brilliant talk that Justin gave. Um, and I think uh, he, he did uh, point out a couple of uh, Pretty nice things that uh, metabolomics tends to be associated with uh, thermo in their Orbitrap family. But uh, there are other instrument platforms, and sometimes Orbitrap, um, you might not have one in your laboratory, or it might not be the correct instrument for what it is that you want to actually do. So we'll talk about trying to use the right approach and the right instrument for the right project and all that it entails so that you get the best possible data quality to then make use of the, the sort of tools that Justin has uh, linked to. So the first thing to point out, and it's uh, I'm treating this as a, a very much a primer, um, the choice of instrument that you uh, use will dictate your experimental design and methodology. Uh, and that starts off uh, potentially at the sample collection stage, not even uh, at the point of sample preparation, but can dictate uh, how you collect your sample, how you store your sample after the collection, and how you store the sample uh, prior to preparation. The steps that you undertake during the sample preparation to get the sample into the correct state for your chosen instrument and uh, how you're then going to analyze that sample on your chosen instrument. And as you can sort of understand from following on from, from Justin's slides, 
the way that you acquire data and the way that you uh, generate it, um, and he talked, a very, very good example is the, the differences in the collision cells in the Orbitrap, um, in the Tribrid uh, family. That can have a heavy influence on your data processing. Um, now, I'll talk about things like in-source fragmentation versus collision-induced dissociation um, and how that, that can impact on how you um, analyze your data uh, a little bit later on. But it is, uh, it is very, very uh, important to consider um, when you're designing your experiment um, and how you're thinking about the instrumentation, how you're going to process that data. Um, as you'll see, and some of you will, will undoubtedly know this already, um, there's a lot of scripts and custom software for certain platforms. There's very little uh, scripting and code available for other platforms. So if you're lucky to have a, an Orbitrap in your lab, you'll know that you can go on uh, places like GitHub and find a significant number of scripts that will let you do quite a lot of different things with your data. If you've got um, maybe an older instrument or um, for, for various reasons, you've got maybe something like a, a Perkin Elmer instrument, there's less uh, less software, less scripting available, and uh, you might have to be a little bit more um, restricted, a little bit more cautious in how you process your data there. One thing that I uh, often have to, to remind people to do, and, and mentioning this uh, now, uh, and we'll come back to it, is that you really should optimize your experimental design for your instrument choice. Um, now that can be uh, from things like uh, the, the chromatography side of things, optimizing um, the, the settings for your chromatography system, or it can be the settings for the, 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 the mass spectrometer, if indeed you do use a mass spectrometer. Don't just blindly uh, follow the um, examples or uh, methods in papers that you're referring to. Um, you might find, for instance, that people have decided to use low injection volumes uh, because they had a relatively small sample. Um, you might be able to use a larger injection volume uh, because you've got more sample and that can, can benefit uh, sensitivity or um, it might give you more flexibility for multiple injections and doing more uh, different types of, of analysis with uh, your samples. As you can see from, from Justin's slides, you, you do need to be realistic about data quality. Um, you have to think about the outputs, particularly if you've got a project um, and you need to actually have um, deliverables. And you also have to think about your processing times. And there's also things like storage, backing up your data. And um, you have to think about that uh, at the very start of your project. It is not something that you should be thinking about as a, as a, a last minute um, add on. Um, the last thing that you really want to be doing is generating data at such a high quality um, and with such large file sizes that it's difficult to store the data. It becomes difficult to back up the data um, or that it takes so long to process the data that you're unable to get through all of your sample set. That's particularly important if you're a PhD student and you have a, a sort of time limit where you need to um, have a thesis submitted. Um, it can also be if you've got a, a project um, or a grant deadline, then you need to have deliverables produced. Um, it is important to make sure that you're um, you're thinking sensibly about how long it's going to take you to process the data. And you also have to think about uh, monitoring your data as you're generating uh, data. You have to uh, use what is produced sensibly to ensure that the instrument is working correctly. Um, throughout the run. So if you're running large uh, metabolomic studies where you potentially are looking at hundreds or thousands of samples over many, many weeks or months, you have to make sure that you're monitoring the instrument um, frequently enough to catch any problems that arise in terms of losses of sensitivity, um, configuration problems, uh, loss of retention time, um, damage to columns or, or other parts of the instrumentation. Um, and it is, is very, very important to point out that poor decisions made during the experimental design stage can't always be fixed later. So if you're not paying attention to what's happening with your instrument and you uh, run hundreds or thousands of samples after the column has become damaged, 
um, it can be very, very difficult or almost impossible to do retention time correction um, on so many samples. And that adds on to the sort of processing time. Um, it can add on to the, the amount of storage space that you need. Um, so you have to think very carefully about how uh, not only you're going to um, design your experiment, how you're going to monitor as you undertake that experiment. And that's a, how you do that is a, a dictated by your choice of instrumentation as well. Um, some instruments now have um, various options uh, within the acquisition software to check for things like carryover to see if they're um, uh, having problems with uh, contamination between samples and uh, batches. So it might be that you want to make use of, of new tools that are available. So how do you decide what instrumentation to use? Well, firstly, um, you need to understand what questions you're trying to answer uh, with your work. What is it that you're looking for? Um, what do you think, um, and I refer back to Justin again, he said, you, we often go into metabolomics experiments with a good idea of what it is we're expecting to see. And so that obviously shapes um, uh, how we undertake those experiments, how we design and build the experiments. Um, but it's also important that partly one of the reasons we, we go into experiments uh, knowing roughly what we expect to see is because we have an experience and knowledge of the platform and we know what uh, the strengths and weaknesses of individual instruments, individual techniques are. Um, but if you're starting out, um, you need to sort of learn that uh, early on, understand um, what it is that you're looking for and understand how you're going to find it. So you then need to learn how the choice of your instrument uh, can help and hinder answering those questions. Um, now, not all instruments are uh, made equal. People use things like the Orbitrap family because they're very, very uh, good uh, for separation capabilities. They're very high resolution. And they form a backbone of, of what we'd describe as high resolution mass spectrometry. But um, getting some of your analytes in and out of the um, Orbitrap itself through the C-trap um, can cause some unwanted fragmentation. So if you've got a number of um, metabolites that are quite um, sensitive to fragmentation, it might be that an Orbitrap um, isn't necessarily the best uh, instrument to use. Sometimes the choice of instrument um, it can be prone to contamination or, um, again, going back to, and I don't want to be seen to be knocking the Orbitrap family because they're extremely good, but you can sometimes get little artifacts in the, the um, spectra from the way that the Fourier transformation process works on the detector. And that can, uh, there's a few horror stories of people that spend months or years looking for uh, what they assume to be a metabolite that isn't actually present. It's it's uh, sort of noise from the instrument. So you have to understand how the instrument works and uh, read about some of the horror stories. It's always uh, easier said than done because um, publications tend to be the, the success stories, not the horror stories. So um, ask around and speak to people, uh, particularly if you can get to conferences again. Find out, you know, what's the good things, but also what's the bad things that they've they've suffered with their um, with their instrumentation. At the cost, speed and instrument availability is always going to dictate to a larger or smaller degree how you undertake work. And I know uh, for a, a number of people, um, you have one or two instruments available and you don't have a great, great deal of choice. But sometimes it's worthwhile um, undertaking collaborations or visiting another laboratory or um, begging for instrument time on a vendor's instrument to get um, samples run on the on the best instrument possible for what uh, you think you're going to find in your uh, sample set. And as I say, talking about the, the data analysis, um, how you want to process that data and potentially if, if you're looking at uh, combining data sets from things like metabolomics with genomics and proteomics, uh, the tools that are available 
um, and the, the pathways that you might want to then uh, process that data will have some level of impact on your choice of instrument. Um, so it might be that there's a better instrument for the analyte, but then for the data processing, uh, a better format exists from another vendor. And it's it's a choice of, of going uh, and, and, and taking the optimum route for your data processing. And as I say, maybe you will have no choice at all. Uh, maybe you have one or two instruments and you're really uh, stuck with using what you have in, in, in front of you. Um, so when that occurs, um, and as I say previously, make sure that you tailor your project to best utilize what you have available. Um, you might have a specific configuration that differs from a paper. So as I say, make sure that you, you design your experiment to make the full use of uh, the instrumentation. And it can be as simple as something like you, you have the capability to run um, 96 well plates rather than 54 uh, sample um, vial holders. So you can make use of that capability, run more samples, add in more quality control samples, um, make full use of the, the time um, that you have on the instrumentation. So the first sort of stage um, is, uh, do you want to actually use chromatography? So we've we've assumed that we've we've got our, our sample and, and we're, we're thinking right. Um, we've not even started to process the sample. It's not prepared yet. Um, still sitting in its its little falcon tube or its its glass test tube, depending on how we've um, stored the sample when we uh, collected it. What chromatography do I want to use? Do I want to use gas chromatography? Do I want to use liquid chromatography, or do I want to do something a little bit more um, specialized, a little bit more complex? And. The type of chromatography that you're going to use will, uh, in part, uh, dictate some of your sample preparation requirements. Um, in some cases, you might want to do things uh, without any uh, plastic consumables or, as far as possible, eliminate plastic um, to, to minimise the amount of phthalates and, and plasticizers that go onto your, your system. Uh, sometimes you might want to keep glass out of it. So if you're looking at doing some sort of elemental analysis with a uh, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometer, um, you might very well want to make sure that you're doing everything in plastic because some of your glass consumables, uh, test tubes, bottles, and, and, and the like can leach out uh, solvents, uh, sorry, they can leach out uh, uh, compounds, elements, like sodium and, and uh, um, even things like lead can come out of some of the glassware. So it's it's important to think about um, sample preparation. For some samples, there will be no wrong answer. Uh, you can you can analyze them in, in many different ways, and it will come down to what you have available that will kind of uh, allow you to, to, to decide uh, on your uh, choice of chromatography and your choice of sample preparation. Derivatization is uh, a particularly good way um, in some techniques to aid separation and uh, it's undertaken typically um, in, in, in techniques like fatty acid analysis to actually make the compounds uh, thermally labile so that you can get them to become uh, sufficiently volatile to, to move through a chromatography system. But you can do some work with the derivatization as well to uh, gain additional separation. Um, there's flexibility there um, to help with the separation. One of the things that we, we have to be uh, aware of is that getting the best separation can, can damage uh, or, or prevent detection. So some really nice chromatographic techniques make use of um, acids and, and iron pairing agents, uh, salts that will uh, prevent a mass spectrometer from ionizing your sample. Some solvents that you might want to use for chromatography um, have uh, UV absorption uh, in the same wavelength that your analytes might have if you're going down a sort of UV detection route. So getting the best separation can sometimes kill detection and sometimes it can be a case of having to balance on a knife edge um, in between getting good separation and doing it in a way that allows your detection 
uh, to still uh, function. There are more complex separation techniques um, becoming uh, much more fashionable um, as vendors embrace it and develop uh, better uh, better finished uh, tools, not having to use scripts and, and bits of um, spliced together code, but actually off the shelf uh, packages now uh, are, are techniques like uh, two dimensional liquid chromatography, um, GC by GC, and um, things like supercritical fluid chromatography is, is um, making a little bit of a resurgence um, as, as the price of solvent creeps up, um, making good use of, of carbon dioxide to, to cut down on the, the amount of liquid solvent that you use is, is uh, a little bit more fashionable. With things like uh, two-dimensional liquid chromatography, that's where um, you would typically um, separate a number of compounds um, with one column. Um, where you, you end up with a number of compounds that, that then um, group together with with one type of call with one type of column or, or one type of, of, of um, mobile phase. We can cut that out of the, 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 the first chromatogram, send it to a second LC system, uh, sometimes using the same mobile phase, sometimes a little bit different in terms of mobile phase, uh, but with a different column and try and gain additional separation. And a 2 DLC system can be a good way um, if you're uh, operating a, a, a mass spectrometer that doesn't have the highest resolution. Um, it can be a good way of getting um, similar molecular weight compounds sufficiently separated that it doesn't matter if the resolution of the instrument's not great. You add in that separation before it reaches the instrument. So um, 2 DLC and, and, and uh, GC by GC uh, techniques are very, very good for that sort of, of um, uh, problem. There's also um, other techniques. Um, Justin touched on things like chirality. Um, you can um, purchase specific columns that have um, specificity for uh, different chiral conformations and get separation uh, based on that. So there's a, a whole world of, of chromatography out there. And often, um, there's a number of people, um, mass spec um, enthusiasts, that that would argue that you don't need resolution on the mass spec. Uh, you should be sorting everything out right at the very start with um, the chromatography. And one of the questions that often comes up is HPLC or UPLC, what's, what's better? Um, it depends on the question that you're asking and how you want to um, undertake your analysis, but um, I would say from from my preference, um, UPLC is always going to be better because you get that that greater number of theoretical plates, that better separation. Um, but you can gain more consistency with HPLC and you can be a little bit less um, sensitive to uh, blockages. You can get away with a little bit less filtration. Uh, you can get away with a little bit less uh, rigorous sample preparation uh, with an HPLC column and an HPLC sort of configuration. And that can be beneficial if you've got low levels of analytes that are particularly uh, likely to come out of um, your solution during the sample preparation stage when you add in things like filtration. If they're going to get caught on a, a filter, um, or they're going to get caught on, on, on glassware, uh, plasticware when you're doing the sample prep, then you can cut down a little bit of that and try and, and uh, keep some of your analytes in solution uh, by going for an HPLC approach and, and doing something like a, a dilute and shoot rather than a, an extensive cleanup and sample concentration step. So, one of the things that um, you have to consider is uh, with a mass spectrometer ionization. Everybody thinks that um, you get your your analytes and ionization is is virtually assured, and that could be further from the truth. Um, the electrospray source is widely used, um, but it is not the only option for um, connecting up um, LC with a mass spectrometer. Um, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization EPCI is another uh, very very good uh, alternative and that uses a corona discharge rather than um, putting the electrical charge onto the solvent and then concentrating it down onto your analyte so um, 
think about different um, source options. Um, one of the things that um, that comes up in, in conversations with uh, metabolomics uh, people on a regular basis is things like the, the dark metabolome. We know from doing things like elemental analysis that we've got more compounds in our uh, sample than we're seeing with um, just LCMS. Then we we can we we know through through doing NMR as well that we've got different compounds there. Um, so not everything will ionize with an electrospray source, and you need to be aware of that. Um, and uh, you 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 have to think maybe an alternative um, ionization source might be a good option and it builds out um, the metabolome from just looking at a straight LC electrospray metabolome to something that's a bit bit wider a bit broader um, so you're starting to bring in compounds that will ionize more efficiently with APCI. Um, GC has its alternatives um, electron impact is sort of the 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 usual option um, for, for most GC um, systems, but you can do chemical ionization and you can do some atmospheric pressure, uh, gas chromatography as well. Um, and that, that would typically be where uh, you would often connect up uh, a more LC biased instrument to your GC option. Um, and, and Waters are, are one of the people um, that, that offer uh, APGC uh, interfaces as a way to connect up um, your uh, range of sort of cyclic and eye mobility instruments to a GC source. So you can connect up things like their Synapt and their cyclic uh, eye mobility systems to um, one of Agilent's um, standards like 7890, 8890 GC uh, systems. Uh, polarity can be very important and that can also drive instrument choice. So um, in some cases, uh, you'll want to try and run all of your uh, sample in positive mode, but there will be some analytes that, that ionize uh, vastly better or only in negative mode and vice versa. <coughs> so choosing polarity uh, is important and uh, you might want to run the same sample in both positive and negative modes. If you're limited in terms of your sample volume, you may wish to do polarity switching um, and that can drive instrument choice. There are some instruments out there um, that are not particularly good in one uh, ionization mode. Sometimes they don't work very well in negative mode. Sometimes they lack sensitivity. And going on to sensitivity, um, the ionization performance can impact sensitivity. Um, there's a number of compounds that work very, very well um, in negative mode or in positive mode, but they work to an extent um, in, in um, the alternative mode. So you might find that you get a, a very, very strong signal, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, in terms of, of, of ion count in positive mode, and it drops down to 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 with um, negative mode or vice versa. And that's often accompanied by um, poor ionization efficiency in the source, meaning that your analyte actually stays in the source for quite some time. You lose the sharpness um, that you've had uh, from the chromatography system, um, and that can obviously kill the resolution. So if you've got a very, very high resolution instrument, uh, but you've got a bit of peak broadening because of, of poor ionization efficiency in the source, um, you really want to think, um, how are you going to resolve that? And the mobile phase is a key uh, to, to ionization efficiency. And um, this goes back again to experimental design, sort of there's little loops back all of the way through. Um, so your sort of solvents that you use for your extraction during the sample preparation will dictate your mobile phase and your mobile phase requirements to impact ionization will dictate your extraction solvent. Um, none of this is a sort of one-way street that, that PowerPoint makes it where you've got one slide after the other uh, with uh, the way that, that we would um, undertake analysis. Um, you're dictated by sample preparation and the sample preparation is dictated by analysis. Um, you've got a number of different mobile phases that you can put out there and you've got lots of exotic things, ion pairing agents and things that you can put in there. Um, but for most people, um, um, they'll be thinking about um, an aqueous mobile phase containing something like 0.1% formic acid or 1% or acetic acid. 
um, with the um, organic phase being something like acetonitrile or methanol containing, again, 0.1% formic or, or uh, 1% uh, acetic. What you don't want to do if you can avoid it is have uh, complex mobile phases where um, the concentrations uh, of different um, either solvents or um, acids that are added can vary. That can cause retention time shift and it can be then very, very difficult to um, annotate your data set if you've got the same compounds coming out with quite wide uh, retention time windows. It can be very, very difficult to, to get your um, your data to process there. So you have to think about simplification of your mobile phase wherever possible. Sometimes your best mobile phase and sometimes your best separation, um, as I say, will be something that is not amenable to, to mass spectrometry. So there are other techniques. Um, not, not everybody, I would say, thinks of mass spec and metabolomics as sort of, um, you know, go together like, um, you know, fish and chips or something. It's, it's that kind of uh, symbiotic relationship. But there are other techniques out there, and um, some of them are better suited for different analytes. Um, UV detections uh, widely used with, with LC. Um, you can do HPLC and UPLC, a um, wide range of detectors out there from, from all of the major instrument vendors. Um, you can go with single wavelength, scanning different wavelengths. There's, there's plenty of functionality. Uh, I quite like fluorescence. Um, and you know, if you go on Twitter tomorrow, it's fluorescence Friday, and there's all of the great, um, exciting pictures being shared with things fluorescing. Um, but it, it's it's a really really good technique um, for um, metabolomics if you've got or if you can add a uh, fluorophore um, to your your analytes of interest, uh, because it can be very 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 sensitive. Fluorescence in particular is a really really good technique to get very very high sensitivity. You can do things like refractive index detection, and that's really good for things like sugars where um, and, and compounds that are um, very, very difficult to separate. Uh, tends to be a bit more associated with, with HPLC. Um, GC uh, has options such as flame ionization detection, and there, there are other detectors as well um, that you can use with GC. Um, flame ionization is particularly uh, associated with things like fatty acid analysis um, and we're drifting back towards lipidomics as the subset of metabolomics there, but it's, it can be very, very useful um, and you can get sensitivity there sometimes that um, is hard to achieve with, with uh, a mass spec, particularly when you've got matrix uh, involved. Um, NMR, as Gonzalo talked about, is uh, again a widely used metabolomics technique, um, and in some cases uh, that might be the, the the best option for what you're you're looking at. It might be that getting your compound uh, extracted in, into a, um, a state where it can be analysed by mass spec or even through a liquid chromatography system is is, is unduly difficult. Um, so it might be that you want to go down the route of using uh, NMR for that analysis. Um, it's worth mentioning that because we don't have that mass data um, in terms of um, and fragmentation patterns that, that Justin showed good examples of, um, we can need a bit more in terms of standards and some controls to understand exactly what it is we're seeing in terms of UV or fluorescence. So you might need a few more um, standards in there um, and do more work in terms of matrix matching and things. Uh, so building out the metabolome, as I, I sort of um, hinted at, um, currently metabolomics is widely undertaken with an ESI hallucination source interfaced to a um, liquid chromatography system. But there are other approaches to build out and to, to widen the um, metabolome beyond what we can see with our current uh, technology. As I say, this approach um, misses compounds that don't ionize well or which don't separate well with conventional LC method. So one of the things that um, comes in and out of vogue uh, on a, uh, 
a bit of a basis. It's things like capillary electrophoresis. There are alternatives um, to liquid chromatography, and there are um, other techniques which don't require um, the uh, full chromatographic separation um, to make um, better use of your, your sample. Um, so some of the things that we, we have uh, done a lot of work on here um, are ambient mass spectrometry techniques, um, things like DESI, um, things like DART, and things like REAMS, where we can get uh, better uh, data and better understanding without having to do uh, chromatography by uh, perhaps focusing on smaller groups of molecules instead of trying to, to um, generate uh, chromatograms which have tens of thousands of analytes uh, underneath. Uh, it might be better to focus on a few hundred or a few thousand analytes. And adding in your non-mass spec based techniques can also reveal more information um, about the metabolome. So undertaking um, UV detection, fluorescence detection, in combination with LC data um, can be very, very useful. Um, and thinking about that, again, goes back to the experimental design stage. If you're going to use the same sample um, for multiple analyses, um, you might have to tailor the extraction process or sample concentration process in a way that enables that to happen. So uh, that's always worthwhile thinking about uh, at an early stage is what might I want to do um, with my sample? Uh, after I've done my mass spec. And a question that no, I don't think enough people ask when they're, they're doing the experimental design is, what if this doesn't work with mass spec? Have I, uh, have I processed the sample in such a way that I can't reprocess it with a different uh, instrument? Where do we go from, uh, if we run into a bit of a brick wall, where do we go? How do we deal with um, any, any issues that arise? Um, and as I say, the, the undertaking a wider range of techniques with different configurations can also reveal more information on the metabolome. Um, but as I say, you need to think about sample volume, uh, retaining your samples and, and storage. Uh, it's a bit more uh, complex than just uh, um, running the same sample again. So we go back uh, to experimental design again. And as, as we've now sort of learned from, from going through thinking about the instrument, having knowledge or an educated guess um, to understand what analytes you're interested in is necessary to make an appropriate choice of uh, instrumentation, a configuration. And that, can, as I sort of indicated all the way through, that can be something as simple as choosing the right column for your chromatography system. It is not as, as complex as... Uh, Oh, I want to use an Orbi trap, or I want to use a, a QTOF, or I want to use a, a, a triple quadrupole instrument. Um, but one thing that you really do need to do is learn how to make full use of the capabilities of the instrumentation to obtain the best quality data from your samples. Um, one of the things that I, I see often is, is um, data that has been processed, um, and if it had additional sets of collision energies or if it had um, slightly more uh, separation with chromatography, we could do more work with the data set. So it's, it's important to make full use of the capabilities of the instrumentation um, to, to get the best quality data from your samples. As I say, decide uh, early on on your data acquisition parameters uh, to aid data processing uh, towards the end of your experimentation. Um, you need to think at, at the very start um, very carefully about um, what criteria you need, um, how you're going to process the data, what your pathway is. And as I said before, and I, I cannot reiterate this enough, you need to plan on the routine and ongoing analysis of some of your data. Um, make QC samples, pooled samples, combine different uh, groups. Um, and uh, look at those, even if you're not going to analyze all of your data on an ongoing basis, at least check your QC samples, make sure that the instrument is tuned well, make sure that it is retaining its sensitivity. 
um, and make sure that any problems are uh, uncovered and dealt with at an early stage rather than getting to the end of months of data acquisition and finding that a problem has occurred. Don't be afraid to choose a less glamorous instrument and focus on the right instrument for your needs. So yes, you may be in a lab that's just taken delivery of a, a brand new Orby trap uh, and you want to run your samples on it and you're in a queue with four or five other PhD students or postdocs. But ask yourself, do I actually really need to use an Orby trap? There are people out there running samples on Orby traps that could generate uh, data much, much more easily and much quicker on something like a single quadrupole instrument. Uh, one of the things that people forget about is by playing with um, the source conditions on a single quadrupole instrument, you can get in source fragmentation and you can do almost everything uh, that you can with a, a triple quadrupole or a time of flight instrument um, with a single quadrupole for certain uh, types of analysis. If you know what you're looking for, and if the instrument can scan quickly enough, if it can monitor enough channels, a single quadrupole instrument could be the, the best tool for the job. Um, and you're probably going to have access to that when everybody else is queuing up, waiting for the, the Orbi trap. One of the other things um, that I, I meant to mention, and, and um, it was in a slide and it's drifted out of my slide deck for some reason, is things like targeted analysis. If you've got a small number of analytes, once you've maybe done some of the untargeted work with an Orbi trap or a QTOF, and you know what analytes you're interested in, don't be afraid to optimize then your experimentation and run the same samples again on a triple quadrupole instrument and target uh, the analytes of interest. You'll get vastly greater sensitivity, um, you'll get much smaller uh, file sizes. And uh, by adding in uh, calibration standards and things, you can begin to quantitate uh, your data set, and that can be extremely useful. Um, there's quite a lot of variability with um, high resolution instrumentation in their terms of their sensitivity, and they're never as sensitive as uh, the latest generation of triple quadrupole instruments. Um, also think about what potentially you're missing with uh, uh, a high resolution instrument. Get a feel for the uh, limits of detection uh, with your, your high resolution instrument and think, right, okay, I think there's maybe three or four other compounds in this group that I'm missing and start to build um, some semi-targeted approaches on triple quadrupole. Um, the new generation of triple quadrupoles, whilst clearly not in the same uh, league in terms of scan speeds and, and, and uh, flexibility for untargeted analysis, can do some semi-targeted work um, almost as well as, as, as uh, the, the untargeted um, high resolution instruments. So do think about um, trying some different instrument types and uh, don't be afraid to move your um, methods and, and undertake some different techniques on, on some different uh, instrumentation. And finally, um, gain experience on your instrument of choice if you can. Um, understanding how your data is acquired, understanding the parameters, understanding the settings, getting a feel for changing uh, gas flow rates, temperatures, um, impactor or uh, grid voltages uh, can be very, very useful in understanding um, what's happening in your data when you're looking uh, and doing data processing. So um, if you can get some hands-on experience, and I know different labs have different um, options for, for um, sometimes it'll be shadowing, sometimes it'll be get pushed in front of the machine and left with a little bit of supervision. Um, but if you can get onto an instrument hands-on and gain some experience um, of, of, of playing about with the acquisition software and understanding the impacts that each of the parameters has on the data that you generate, uh, I always think that that's a really useful, uh, helpful way that will aid with your data processing. So I would suggest that as, as an option. So uh, I'm going to uh, thank you all for uh, listening to my uh, talk and happy to answer questions on uh, instrument choice, instrument selection. Um, Uh, does anybody have any questions? 
Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, so Alex Williams, uh, talk a bit about Maldi. I'll mute myself again. Yes, I think uh, I'm not a massive fan of Maldi, which is why it didn't uh, make it into my talk. And I'm tempted to say the way to optimize it would be to take your Maldi instrument and drop it off the top of a very, very high uh, building. Um, but more broadly, um, optimization with Mali is is really, really quite difficult. There's a lot of time is going to be spent on choosing different matrices, um, looking at different approaches in terms of language or uh, spotting. Uh, we're going to have to play about a little bit with um, sprayers if you're using a Mali sprayer to get the matrix onto your uh, sample. Um, the reason I didn't really touch on Mali quite so much is it's the, the one place that um, I, I have a bottle of uh, TFA and uh, usually it's sort of the, the type of um, acid that's banned from mass spec lab, whereas it's it's used quite widely in, in Mali. Um, but it has a number of different uh, requirements. So, so yeah, you, you have trifluoroacetic acid in there, which is... Um, it presents its own challenges, um, but generally, um, from my experience of Mali, which I'm not an expert on Mali um, by any stretch, uh, it seems to be a lot of, of time spent trying different matrix, uh, looking very carefully at the crystallization patterns that you're getting and understanding um, what's happening a little bit in terms of the actual sample surface, because that can have a big impact uh, on the, the behavior of the, the laser. Then, depending on the sort of instrument that you've got, um, if you've got one of the later uh, generation of um, Maldi instruments from the likes of Brooker, which have um, really good performance in both positive and negative ionization modes, then it's a bit of, again, playing about what works better in pause mode, what works better in negative mode, um, trying to understand what's going on uh, in the source and optimizing on that basis can be um challenging um literature searching uh with with Maldi is uh i would say a little bit more useful um than uh than it can be with lcms and gcms because people don't customize their Maldi instruments quite to the same extent um so you can get a bit more uh information out of papers out of the literature and if you've got somebody that's running similar samples, um, if you can, um, and you, you know they've got a similar or, or the same model of instrument, um, getting some information from them, getting them to send over a data file and, and looking at the instrument parameters can be very, very useful. Um, you can try and try and match up um, what's going on there. Um, and then doing the, again, being sensible with um, doing your bacterial test standards when you're running your MALDI, making sure that the instrument is uh, clean, which is a particular challenge with MALDI, making sure the source doesn't get too dirty. If you've got the self-cleaning option, um, maybe whacking that button every Friday night when you're leaving. Um, so you've got something that's uh, in better condition for, for Monday morning and the, the week, the following week, can always be useful. Um, so that would be uh, that would be my my um, all I can really say. I, I would say on Mali is probably the a little bit not much more than it probably says in the the operator's manual that you read when you start. Unfortunately, but um, yeah, it's just it's it's going to be a lot of trial and error. Are there any other questions? We still have about eight minutes to go. No, but if uh, there are no more questions, then this time, this time for real. Are you sure? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, just to to further sort of uh, follow on from Alex, and so yeah, I I think that's that's very very um very very true. We we see Maldi as a, a quick and and cheap profiling tool, and that's that's where we we from our experience in our lab, um, from, from the work that I've done with it, definitely see it um, for that sort of bacterial uh, um, biotyping uh, approach. Uh, very, very good for that. Um, very good for quick screening to see if you've got sort of conjugation going on with uh, biopolymers, that, that sort of thing. Um, but I think you could probably get better results with a little bit more work uh, on a, a traditional LCMS uh, platform. 
Where we do see Maldi um, and that quick and relatively cheap profiling tool is, is where we also see other techniques like um, ASAP. Uh, Waters have that nice little radiant ASAP system. Um, Dart is always floating around. Waters had the Dart QDA set up. Uh, Brooker have bought out Iron Sense and uh, the Dart is now on, uh, you can get it on the Tim's Toff. So there's a, a mixture of um, iron mobility in there. So um, I'm interested to see where Dart goes in terms of uh, metabolomics uh, workflows, um, given it's a, a, a dramatically different ionization technique um, and you have no chromatography prior to ionization, but you can do a bit of separation with the, the, the TIMS. Um, interested to see where that goes but uh there's other yeah the, the ambient techniques can be very very good for for screening as well so not just maldi um dart dart and and, and asap uh, have, have potential there and that can then let you focus a little bit more on um samples that show the biggest differences it can be your starting point for more intense work with um, lcms or, or gcms platforms particularly high resolution stuff so you're you're focusing on stuff that's going to give you the the, the best results to start off with um rather than potentially looking at some samples that have very, very few or, or, or no real statistic uh, differences um but yeah that's just my little happens about screening well, knowing you for how long as I have, I know you can go on with this stuff for hours. But um, yeah, so let's see. I'm definitely checking if there's no more this time. Okay. I think five, we can, we can finish five minutes early then if there are no more questions. Let me just check if there's no hands up again. Uh, thanks everybody for, thank you for coming today. Like I, 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 def I definitely learned quite a bit as well. and. Uh, Hope hopefully we'll see you again in a similar workshop. See you then. <laughs>